I'm Daniel Steinberg, and you are listening to The Magid Method, a new podcast about drushos. Today, my guest is Rabbi Chaim Steinmetz of Kehillat Yeshurun, or KJ, in New York City. Rabbi Steinmetz and I cover a myriad of topics like how to improve your speaking style and sermon structure, how to make your speech more impactful and memorable by using power phrases and evocative imagery. Is there an image I want to want to uh, associate with? Is there a vision? And it, so I tell people, read Martin Luther King, read Churchill, read read Ronald Reagan, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I mean, powerful, powerful phrases of rhetoric. How do you deal with stage fright? You're a young rabbi and you're nervous when you're speaking. You should just know that every rabbi is nervous when they're speaking. We discuss the pros and cons of various sermon styles of rabbis like Joseph and Haskell Lookstein and Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, who is a former assistant rabbi at Kehillat Yeshurun. Rabbi Steinmetz has some very practical advice for striking the right balance between mining your own experiences for drasha material but not going overboard and possibly coming across to your audience as self-absorbed. We talk about some of the most distracting circumstances a rabbi has to speak under and how to be prepared to pivot on the fly when the need arises. And we even talk about the role of AI in crafting a drasha. Should a rabbi be nervous about AI taking their job? Everyone is saying, I they, chat GPT is taking over. And I'm saying, I they, we've given up. Because we, we as humans haven't decided to be more dynamic than ChatGPT. This and more on the Magid Method podcast. Now, without further ado, this is my conversation with Rabbi Chaim Steinmetz. It, it, it's very interesting because when I was younger, I was very machbit, very, very meticulous about only having uh, fresh material. Yep. And kind of you get older and you kind of realize that, you know, David Letterman, I don't know if you watched him in, in, in the day, recently a recursive loop of going back to the same line about 10 times in the same, and sometimes over multiple shows. In fact, you know, Paul, the same shtick with Paul. And people, people don't, don't dislike, um, uh, you know, if there are certain, some very basic things that you kind of stick to. I mean, you're right. You can't give the same sermon every week without a question. Um, but like we have this thing here that Rabbi Lutzin, who, who's an outstanding rabbi, my rabbi emeritus. So he had this thing where, you know, he was also the head of the Ramah school. And we have this thing that at, that at every Chagigat Chumash for the second graders and every Chagigat Sidur for the first graders, he would end it by saying, this is the best one ever. It became so much so that like we can't finish the Chagigat Chumash without Rabbi Lutzin saying, this was the best Chagigat Chumash ever. He comes back, he comes back to everyone, more or less, if he can. And uh, he, he, you know, he uses that line. So, I mean, you're right, you, you always want to be fresh. And, and you know, I would, I would actually talk about this because, you know, sometimes young rabbis think that they, you know, I can, I can recycle. I mean, and you're right, young rabbis need to spend a lot of time stretching and, and, and building their capacity. Uh, and not to sort of sit in, in, in a box and they have to sort of explore uh, different ways of doing things. You can't just do have one formula and say, oh, this formula works. Let me just stick with it. Uh, but at the same time, you can't, uh, it, particularly when you, you sort of get more experienced, if you've got something really good, you, you can go back to it. In other words, you should never feel like you can't go back to it. So it's, you know, this sort of the recycling issue uh, is always a very, very large issue in the rabbinate. Uh, on the one hand, particularly as a young rabbi, you don't want to recycle, uh, uh, certainly not too often, um, but you don't want to recycle because you, you need to be building your capacity and exploring. Um, but if you have really good things, then don't be afraid to, to go back to them and, and don't be afraid to use them. I mean, I remember when I started out in the rabbinate, so I had a, a reform colleague uh, in Mount Vernon, and uh, he used to say, "You want to know what the most important word in the rabbit it is? Recycling." Uh, and and you can, you know, look if you're speaking to two different audiences, you can, and and you don't have the time, you can use the same the same speech if it if it fits the, the both of the audiences. Uh, but and and that's what I do with the Chagigat Chumash and Chagigat Sidur. I make one speech and I give it every single day. I you know you tweak it because you're giving it.
So, I mean, I think that that's, that's you know, one of the, the challenges that a young rabbi has to sort of think through is, okay, do I recycle or do I do new? I would say always the default is to do new, but if you have something really, really good, hang on to it and, and pull it out every so often uh, because it is something that, that's worth repeating. Yeah. So you were a rabbi for 20 years before you even stepped foot in this place where you are now at KJ. I was a rabbi for nearly 30 years. My first my first um, rabbinical position was in the Mount Sinai, the Mount Sinai um, Talmud Torah Synagogue in Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, and I did that while I was still at Yeshiva. It was a weekend job. Uh, I would go. My late mother would, would cook some food for me. I would bring the food with me to the shul. There was actually a, an apartment in the shul to sleep in. And uh, I was I was there. I, I got started there. I, you know, I would go drive out one night a week for a shear. And on Shabbat, we would have a Friday night sort of mini shear. And then Shabbat morning, I would give a sermon. And then, you know, there was no min chamara because it was a, a tiny synagogue. It had been once a very large synagogue. And the area had uh, changed and it was mostly older members. And uh, that's what I would do. I mean, I still have uh, one very good friend who was a young member at that point, uh, who at, at that point was not an observant Jew and, and then later became a rabbi, Greg Wall, uh, who I became friend, friends with from, from Mount uh, Sherman Avenue, uh, uh, Mount Sinai Sherman Avenue, Talmud Torah. And actually, as you could tell from the name, it was a merger of two synagogues. Then I went to the Fleetwood Synagogue in Mount Vernon, which was, I was there for four years. And I was in Montreal for 20 years uh, at uh, TBDJ or uh, Bailey Road Shul or whatever people had different names for it in Cote St. Luke, uh, which is an area of Montreal. And then I came here to KJ eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about recycling, I mean, you had a, a wide repertoire before you even uh, stepped up to the pulpit at, at uh, KJ. So how much did you recycle? So here's, here's the type of recycling that I do. There might be ideas. There certainly are stories uh, that occur to me over the years that I'll, I'll reuse. Uh, there might be themes that I'll reuse. But if I'll look back and I'll say, okay, this week is Vayachi. Let me see what I did in Vayachi in 2004. I will never use the same sermon. Um, almost because it's difficult for me to give the same sermon. Like I, I just, I, 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 I get bored with, with hearing the same thing twice. So, uh, and when I speak, I hear myself. So uh, I, you know, you have to, you have to sort of do something new to keep yourself interested. And, and also I, I you know, thank goodness. I, I feel like every year I evolve. In other words, that I get better. Uh, and so I, there are things I did in 2004 I, that I look at and I say, I would never do this again. Uh, and I, I would prefer to do it differently. So I do recycle. Look, the Parsha every week is a recycling because we've we've read this Parsha, and if um, you're 30 years in the rabbinate, you've spoken about this Parsha for 30 years. Uh, so you're, you're going to automatically be going back to the same Parsha. So I, I will take things that I've done in the past, but I'm, I'm always looking for new, and I'm always looking to reshape it and come at it differently. And I think that that is part of what, what gives me, so to speak, satisfaction. Uh, you know, the, the Hebrew phrase would be sipuk anefesh. It gives me satisfaction doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So you recycle, you'd say elements of, of, your, of your previous rushes, but not uh, the whole kit and caboodle. Right. Makes sense. Um, so let me ask you, KJ, you know, it's the Lookstein, uh, you know, dynasty. Uh, and so, uh, and very well known for homiletics. Uh, <laughs> Joseph Lookstein was the uh, teacher of Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb. And uh, and Norman Haskell, Lamb was an assistant rabbi here at the synagogue. Yeah. And, and Haskell Lookstein, the, the, the rabbi emeritus, is, uh, teaches homiletics, I think, at YU. Or, or, uh, I don't know if he still does. But so, so. Walking into this established uh, style of sermon, uh, well, well, first of all, let me ask you, how, how would you describe it, if you could typify it for, for people? So first of all, I, Joseph Lookstein and, 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 and Rabbi Haskell Lookstein, and even Joseph Lookstein and Rabbi Norman Lamb <laughs> did, did things differently. 
Um, you know, look, Joseph Lipstein used to go and listen to some of the, the preachers who were well known to sort of get a sense of, of their style and to grow from their style. And I could talk about that in a moment because that, that's actually a, a terrific way um, for uh, any speaker to learn. And, and I, I would, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. But Joseph Lukstein and, and Rabbi Haskell Lukstein tells me that Joseph Lukstein every Shabbat morning would be pacing the room, his living room, for an hour, an hour and a half, so to speak, setting up the sermon, which he spoke from basic notes, just like a card with a couple of notes on it, and spoke extemporaneously, most, more or less. And Rabbi Haskell Lukstein said, I don't want to ever do that. And so he would have every single word of the sermon written down beforehand. And he would, of course, I mean, he could certainly speak extemporaneously in the middle. And I noticed that's what Norman Lamb did as well. And Rabbi Lukstein, Rabbi Haskell Lukstein tells me that the reason why he never wanted to do what his father did is because he wanted to enjoy davening. And he knew that his father pacing the hall for an hour, an hour and a half on Shabbos morning, getting the sermon right. And then through davening, the wheels are turning, right? The wheels are turning throughout davening. And so it's hard to really focus on what you're doing. And he wanted to have everything written out. And it's interesting because when I came here, I, of course, was, was someone, I think a lot of yeshiva guys write, uh, speak from notes. Uh, it's daunting when you're a young rabbi to, to think I have to write out the entire sermon beforehand. And you're, you're kind of speaking extemporaneously is sometimes a little bit easier. Uh, but then, you know, when you want to get it right, uh, you spend that hour and a half. And I, I you know, when he, when he told me about this, it, it, I saw myself. I would spend an hour and a half Shabbat morning pacing. Uh, and that's how I would do sermons. So now... It's interesting because of Rabbi Haskell Lofstein, I, I've done, made one or two changes. I still speak from notes. I still speak extemporaneously. Uh, it is, uh, in hindsight, perhaps even a little bit more difficult. Uh, like I said, as a young rabbi, you think, okay, I write out my notes and then I'll figure it out Shabbos morning. Uh, then when you get more experience and you want to make sure Shabbos morning comes out perfectly because you, you've been disturbed with all of the times that you're looking for the right phrase and you're, you're pausing or you're waiting and the right words just don't come out. And so you say, okay, I need to really rehearse this. And then you start to rehearse and then you start to actually take your notes and you have to re, re, rethink them and say, no, maybe I should do it in a different order. And you'll very often get up and, and almost do a, a sermon from memory. So I, I realize that it's easier to write things out. I still like to do it that way, frankly. I do, I'm, I'm much more careful in, in my writing of the notes actually, because I kind of work through, I do the rehearsal and then write the notes off the rehearsal uh, on already on Thursday or Friday. I make sure everything is kind of put down uh, but I do follow Rabbi Haskell Lukstein's method uh, during two very specific situations. First is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which I think is just too anxiety provoking um, for a rabbi, even 30 odd years into the rabbinate, I'm still nervous Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, less nervous now, and in particular, less nervous since co uh, Corona, because Corona, I, I gave many sermons and I kind of realized like, okay, and I'll talk a little bit about Corona also. We'll get to a couple of topics. Yeah. But, I, you know, I started to write things out for Shun and Yom Kippur just to make my life easier. And I used the written out form. Uh, this year, Yom Kippur, I had a bad cold. Kol Nidre, I could not get written through my written text. Uh, the next morning, I, I went to a different service. So it was the same sermon. And there I just said, okay, I'm just going to have to say what I can and try to short abbreviate it. And actually, you know, I, I did complete, I did the same sermon, but moved it around and did it extemporaneously and basically said, look, let me get to the basic point because my voice is very limited. This is what I got to say. And, and sometimes that actually comes out a lot better. So I've moved to doing a written format for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, not the rest of the year. And then the other time, where it's really useful to have something written out is at weddings. 
because weddings under the chuppah, it, it is, the chuppah is the most distracting place that a rabbi could give a speech because everybody around you is doing something. They're not sitting quietly because you're under the chuppah with the parents, you're with the couple, you're with the photographer. There's so much, uh, so much static that's in nature that it's much easier to have a, a fully written text uh, and read off the fully written text. It makes it much smoother. You want to get it right. Uh, the photographer is pushing you or taking shots and there's flashes going off. Uh, the couple is, is, is looking at each other. The parents are, are, are sometimes saying, what about this? Or what about that? Can we, can we get this? So uh, weddings, they also move to written text. So I, I kind of, I'm, I'm still with the old fashioned, which was the Rabbi Joseph Lipstein style, which by the way, Maurice Lamb, I remember him telling me that that was his style, unlike his brother, Norman Lamb. Um, and uh, doing the extemporaneous, I mean, off note, uh, and with with a lot of rehearsal. But in two instances, I like having a written text. When you say that you were nervous, uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, morning, what are you nervous about specifically? Well, you want to give a really good sermon. Uh, so, and and the shul is is more full than it ever is. Uh, in most places, like in, in Montreal, we opened up, our social wall was behind uh, the sanctuary, and we opened up and we had rows and rows and rows, and this is the one time you see everybody, uh, and you see people that you don't see other times during the year, uh, so it's a pressure situation, so of course you're, you're more nervous than an ordinary sermon. Uh, I like to tell young rabbis, I'm nervous every time I get up and speak. Uh, it's not, uh, it, it may look easy, uh, but it's not. And so if you're a young rabbi and you're nervous when you're speaking, you should just know that every rabbi is nervous when they're speaking and you just learn how to speak through the nervousness. It's not a big deal. Yeah. What about funerals? Notes or no notes? Funerals is notes. Funerals are, are, are much more staid. I, I don't feel a need to write out every word. Um, it, it, it actually funerals are, and, and, and here's the thing is that when you write out every word, what you do lose is sort of this interaction with the audience. Funerals are probably the one place where you really have uh, the highest level of interaction with the, your audience. Usually, I mean, unfortunately, most synagogues, your pulpit leads you a good 15 feet from the, or 10 feet from the, the closest uh, congregant. Um, and in funerals, you might be four feet from the family. Um, and so you can sort of, look at their eyes and you can talk to them and and then it, it actually is, is sometimes more meaningful especially if you knew the person who passed away uh to ad lib and to sort of have it almost in a, in a conversational style so uh, funerals it's, it's actually i find it much much better to do it from notes because you'll you'll be ad libbing anyway i mean look you can ad lib even with written notes like there's no reason why you can't ad lib with written notes you don't have to follow uh, the actual written text, uh, and you're allowed to stop in middle, and things will happen. Uh, you know, I, I was just uh, my my colleague uh, uh, down the block. I was at an event at his shul, uh, Elliot Cosgrove, who's the rabbi of, of the conservative synagogue, and it was a, it was a large Israel event. And as he's speaking, the phone rings, and so he had a line which i'm sure he's used before he says if it's my mother tell her i'll call her back uh and uh you know that's that's you know you have to be ready uh, i i had a line for many years uh because kids would always scream right in the middle of kol nidre or right in the middle of the yom kippur sermon and i would always say uh you know because also the parents would be embarrassed so my line was is that there is no sweeter sound in a synagogue than a child crying because that means that there will be a Jewish future. And, you know, you have to be ready to pivot. I mean, sometimes you have the lines ready beforehand. It took a couple of crying babies until I arrived at that uh, particular formula. But yeah, I mean, e even with a, with a prepared text, you're going to need to be ready to pivot if something happens. Uh, and you're going to need to say, oh, you know, I'm saying this, so-and-so over here, just did something heroic or something like that. So you, you may you may have to pivot right in the middle. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that, that uh, at funerals, I would prefer to go 
uh, with, with notes and sort of have that interactive ability. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the, uh, the role models and influences that, uh, that you speak of earlier when uh, you talk about listening to, let's say, pastors or uh, different people like that. So like I said, Rabbi Joseph Lucine would listen to some of the great preachers here in New York. Um, I know years ago, people would read the sermons of Simon Greenberg, who was a, a well-known conservative rabbi uh, in Philadelphia. And, and or modern, all the YU rabbis would read his sermons anyway, uh, because they were brilliant sermons. Uh, but I, I tell people, you, you need to sort of perhaps look a little bit broader. And you need to look at like the speeches of Winston Churchill. Or, or Martin Luther King, or Ronald Reagan, who uh, to my mind are probably uh, this past century's greatest speakers. And the things that you learn from, let's say a speaker like Martin Luther King is like taking a, a, a biblical image of Moses going to the mountaintop. I mean, his famous, famous last speech in Memphis is that I've been to the mountaintop, right? That he's, he's looking into the promised land, but he's not going to get there, uh, which is a prophetic speech, frankly. Um, that's powerful, but the way that they use a biblical image to then offer a perspective of what's going on in his own life, and it's the use of images, right? In other words, or, or, or strong phrases, you know, blood, sweat, and tears from Churchill, or Churchill after the war talking about an iron curtain descending in the heart of Europe. Literally, the phrase iron curtain was used over and over again. Now, it's it's difficult to come up with those phrases. You need to sort of sit to yourself and say, okay, is there an image I want to want to uh, associate with? Is there a vision? And it's interesting because just recently I've been talking to people about the anti-Semitism tax because I say, if you go down the street to the church just down here on Park Avenue and 85th, they have their doors wide open. There's no one there. And you come down here to KJ and we've got three guards outside and then another guard behind in, in, in between double doors. And I say that we're, we're carrying this particular cost of security, which is probably close to $300 a family. And we're a large synagogue. Uh, we're, we're carrying it because anti-Semites have levied attacks against Jews. Now, anti-Semitism tax is one of those phrases that, that's very powerful, uh, so much so that I got called by Fox News to come on the national news a, a week and a half ago because they saw that phrase. They said, this is a great phrase and they want you to be there. So one of the things I learned from these great speakers is also the use of power phrases, powerful images to think about them before you put together something that you're going to write. And, and you know, every time, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll talk in a moment about how I write an article now every week since COVID. I always look to find a title that will jump out at you. It, it could be something simple. How to choose a wife, right? Which is, you know, you want to talk about the contrast between Yitzchak and, and Yaakov's ma uh, marriages or how they enter marriage and how they, they find their spouses. Uh, that's a great title. Uh, I did one on Rachel and Leah, which, you know, talking about how they related to their very difficult marriage. And, and this one, like it went right out of the park because of just the title. It was Marriage and Other Disappointments. That was the, the title of the article. And everyone read it because everyone is curious about, okay, wait, wait, what do you mean marriage and other disappointments? Uh, and I did speak about how, all of us are Rachel's. We all have these great dreams of marriage, and then we have to adjust. And it's Leah who does the tough word of work of adjustment. Anyway, I mean, without getting into that whole Torah. But the key, the key is to have power phrases, power images, and and to use your language carefully, and to structure. I mean, if you follow, I mean, Churchill, the structure is just brilliant. It's absolutely, and and he. I mean, these are, are speeches he gave extemporaneously. I mean, he also spent hours going back and forth. But if you read any of the biographies of Churchill, he did them extemporaneously. So I tell people, read Martin Luther King, read Churchill, read, read Ronald Reagan, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I mean, powerful, powerful phrases of rhetoric. Uh, and, and Reagan also a very 
you know, the thing about Reagan, which is actually going to be useful for yeshiva students in particular, is you come out of yeshiva and your emphasis is finding the most profound insight and categorizing and, and, uh, and putting in, not just categorizing, but actually inventory every single idea. And you, you sometimes overwhelm the crowd with complexity, right? I, I used to tell you, Shiva students, you can ask one question. Really, in a sermon, don't ask three questions or four questions before you get to the answer. I, I, I mean, it's not a hard and set rule, but you need to st- look for simplicity. And Reagan was able to compress ideas that, that were very thoughtful into very direct, simple prose. Almost, almost he was misunderstood because of it. But that's, that's the point, is to get things that are fascinating, get things that, that, that get people's attention. There should always be a chiddish in every sermon. Think of what your chiddish is. What am I telling them that they don't know? Now, it's not what am I telling them that I don't know. You may have known this three years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago, but what am I telling them that they don't know? And come up with that chiddish, but do it in a way that it's absolutely accessible. So again, these are like three role models and, and just really sit and read the speeches and absorb them. I think that's a, an excellent method of, of sort of learning how to speak, just listening to those or, or reading those speeches. Yeah, amazing. In terms of the, so you talked about the style of sermon, uh, the Lookstein and Lamb and and, uh, and uh, Lookstein Sr. Uh, in, in terms of notes versus no notes, what about the the structure? What about the the kind of I, I guess for, format formality of the, of the sermon versus uh... yeah I, I mean it, it, it's it's formality in language which is is not a, a terrible thing per se uh, you still want to speak in a manner that that people kind of hear you uh, but you don't want to speak in a manner that sounds too casual uh, Maurice Lamb once a remark to me it, it should be elevated living room conversation, meaning it should be, you're having a thoughtful conversation with your friends in the living room. Uh, it doesn't have to sound like a lecture. It shouldn't sound like a lecture. Uh, you know, Rabbi Haskell looks teen, so even he, like some of his sermons are more lecture-like and some are, are very down to earth and very direct and very speaking to you uh, directly. So I think that, that I would just say is, is something, <laughs> you know, you have to just sort of think about it. It's like, how do I speak as, as directly as possible? I, I personally tend towards, and, and you can go back and forth in a sermon. It doesn't have to all be an elevated lecture style and it doesn't have to be, all be sort of folksy, let me speak to you directly. You can sort of pause in middle of a faulty sermon and say something that's that's sort of intense and, 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 and elevated and vice versa. You can stop in the middle of a, of a very elevated lecture and just say something. And let me tell you just straight to the point. I mean, this is this, you know, uh, you know, I, I could think of someone giving a lecture now about anti-Semitism and, and just stopping it and saying, they just hate us. Let's not, let's not mince words. These people here who are coming after Israel, they're coming after us. You know, and, and to say it without all of the sophistication that you need to use perhaps for a lecture. So, I, I mean, I think that everyone needs to know their audience uh, and needs to know what they're, they're going to respond to. Uh, I, you know, I, I personally, I, I would say when I started, I, I, you know, I sort of used the, the Reader's Digest Um, And and I still sometimes go back to the Reader's Digest formula, which is clear ideas, short sentences, don't use a fancy word when you can use a simple one, uh, which is probably the opposite of scholarship, right? Scholarship is use jargon when you can actually use normal language. Uh, And and here it's the Reader's Digest formula, short sentences, direct sentences, don't use words that are, are SAT words when you can actually use an ordinary word. And, and that's, uh, you know, and everyone has to decide. I mean, 
Uh, I remember a rabbi years ago telling me you should always use three words in your sermon that no one in the synagogue knows what they mean. Uh, to sort of let them know that you're, you're that you're a step ahead of them. I, I I never took to that that particular point of view, but it, it, it you know it, it, I I myself move between both poles, and and there are times where I feel I need to speak more directly, and I will, and like I said, I'll use the Reader's Digest style, and then there are times where I want to be more sophisticated, and I'll say no, no, I can't, I can't employ that style right here. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about earlier the distance between yourself and the congregation. The pulpit is sometimes 10 to 15 feet away from the nearest congregate. Uh, do you ever get out from behind the pulpit? And, uh... Well, in KJ, not possible. Uh, in in uh, my previous shul, you spoke from behind the bima. And so many times I would move, walk in front of the bima to get closer to the crowd. Uh, in KJ, the bima is three steps up. And there's literally a pulpit in it, uh, which as pulpits go, maybe, or classic pulpits go, is maybe not the worst because I remember there was a synagogue on Fifth Avenue, uh, the youngest real Fifth Avenue, where the pulpit literally was, there was a small staircase and you were totally above the congregation. Uh, the advantage of being in a pulpit is, is actually vocal. Um, it's easier for people to hear you uh, if you're standing higher. Uh, but the disadvantage is, is that there is a, a whole wooden, uh, apparatus that's in between you and then you're high up which the height is between you and the audience although in our synagogue with a balcony it kind of works for the women and then and then there's uh, also a, an entire aisle that's between you and and the the closest pew on the men's side so it, it's it's different and 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 it, it actually forces you perhaps to speak a little bit differently you mentioned Elliot Cosgrove earlier. Uh, he's actually slated to be on the podcast coming up. Um, and I saw a video of him speaking and he, there was no pulpit. He was standing on the stage addressing people in a very informal type of way. And uh, I, I found it to be you know, from, from a comedian's perspective, it, it was very, very effective. Uh, you know, you build that intimacy with, with the congregation. and the Yes, but he, he does use now a teleprompter. He used to read from notes and now he uses a teleprompter. So well, it's, it's much easier if you have a teleprompter. Uh, uh, I guess it didn't, so, I, I could uh, see that from uh, yeah, behind the camera. Yeah, yeah. But when you're in a synagogue, I, I, even for a weekday event, you see the you see the teleprompter working. I, I assume he, you can ask him, but I think he does use a teleprompter. Uh, so uh, it, it it is, uh, and yes, but but you know what? Look, the old rabbis, the Louis Rabinowitzes. Now this is a really old name. He was a great rabbi in South Africa. The old rabbis, they spent a lot of their week on the sermon. Uh, they, you know, what we're doing now with our super connected society where the members are talking to you 24-7 uh, just didn't happen uh, in those days, in the 1960s, the 1950s, the 19, and maybe the early 1970s. And Louis Rabinowitz, those, those type of rabbis, what they would do is they would write out the full text and then they would memorize it. And they would get up and recite and memorize text like you would recite if you were an actor using a script. And that was unbelievable. Now, of course, that's incredibly time intensive because if it takes you seven hours, eight hours to compose a sermon, whatever it is, it'll take you another 10 hours, at least early on, 15 hours to memorize it. And to rehearse it but that's that's a style and to be able to do that to read rehearsed lines from memory which is essentially what churchill did i uh, i don't know if he wrote but in his mind he had the words and then he would sit and he would in his rehearsal he would have uh, literally every word in his his speeches uh, set up uh, if you can do that i mean that's if you have if you have a speech that you want to do without notes uh, and you want to do it in a manner that really in impresses people, write everything out and memorize it like a script. And, and that, that will be the most impressive way to do a sermon. Right. Who's got that, who's got that time? Uh, probably right. well, other areas you know, of your congregation are going to suffer if you spend that disproportionate amount of time. Right. Imagine. And, and, and that, that is always an issue for rabbis that, that your number one job is not necessarily to give a sermon. Uh, and the other thing is, is that 
if I had three weeks to, to write a sermon, it would be much better. I know that. Uh, and um, but you you have a deadline, and and you have to live with deadlines. Uh, so you have to just you know deal with it as it is. Let me ask you about sermon length. Uh, I saw a quote that uh, I think it was uh, Rabbi Luxtein, uh, Rabbi Meritus of uh, uh, Haskell, said that when he began in 1958, his sermon was 35 minutes long. And then when he closed out uh, 37 years or so later, it was between 15 and 20 minutes long. Uh, so how about today in 2023? What, what, what are your sermons? So I will tell you what I've done, but let's let's be honest the the sermons have dramatically changed uh it, there was a time where a rosh Hashanah sermon was expected to be 45 minutes and if it was short people would wonder why didn't you give a full rosh Hashanah sermon and I, i'm talking about not all that long ago i'm talking about maybe 40 years ago 45 years ago um in the in the late 70s it was still like that certainly in the 30s and 40s in, in the classic synagogues i had a friend who was a reform rabbi uh in in scarsdale and i remember him telling me because he had he had uh, been the assistant rabbi in in the cleveland uh the great reform synagogue in cleveland which was one of the the big ones and he said that his sermons were 45 minutes and that when he came he was in scarsdale at the at the time when he came to Scarsdale, he would take his his old Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur sermons and cut them in half and use them almost for two days. He would turn them into two sermons. So it, the time has changed. Uh, obviously, people's attention spans have reduced. Uh, same thing with Chazanut, by the way. I mean, people would, would complain if they got out of synagogue early, believe it or not. There was a time in the 50s that people would complain if they got out of synagogue early because synagogue was... In many ways, they're great entertainment. Uh, that certainly never happens now because everybody has, first of all, a shorter attention span and everybody has less time. So what has happened with me personally, you know, speaking of, yes, 15 to 20 was my sermon length when I got here. Maybe it was a little more than 20 once in a while, 22, 23. But 15 to 20 was, was the basic guideline. Uh, what happened is that COVID came. COVID changed the way that I do the rabbit. Uh, it, it, you know, my colleagues here don't necessarily all, all like my method, and that's fine. You know, we have Rabbi Luxi is still giving sermons, and my associate rabbis are still doing their sermons. But I changed the way I do things in COVID, and and it, it's a two a two step um, change. First of all, I write a weekly for Torah. I have been doing that now, uh, more or less since early 2020. I've been writing a weekly Dvar Torah that's sent by email to the synagogue. Uh, and that, by the way, is an enormous amount of work. Uh, that, in other words, because it's, it's you know, it, it's not a Dvar Torah as much as it's sort of a, a hybrid article Dvar Torah. It always has to sort of have, have some sort of connection uh, to, to a larger idea. Uh, it's not just, you know, how do I explain uh, what does it mean when the brothers sit down to eat bread uh, while they're selling Yosef? You know, you have to come up with something further than that. You have to come up with a, a further idea. Um, but I write an article every week. And then what I did during COVID, uh, you know, because we wanted to make Tfila shorter, is I spoke for two minutes after davening, after the announcements. What I do now is I speak for about five to seven minutes. Sometimes if it's necessary, I will give a full sermon. Uh, and sometimes I will give a lengthy sermon. Um, we have an endowed lecture on chesed, which usually we have a guest speaker. And this year the guest speaker was supposed to come from Israel. So he couldn't come because it was right at the beginning of the war. And I had just been in Israel to visit. So I gave the endowed lecture in his stead. So that was uh, uh, probably close to 30 minutes. Uh, so I still give full sermons. And I, I had to give another sermon recently. Uh, but I, when I'm in the pulpit, I, I mean, really, maybe it's not five to seven anymore. Now it's about 10, but it's a 10-minute sermon. And sometimes it's really just a, a short hit. It's actually very difficult for rabbis to do that after they've kind of gotten used to doing long sermons, right? In other words, I, 
if you're a football fan, to, to for the quarterback to throw from a three-step uh, uh, step drop rather than a five- or seven-step drop is a totally, totally different type of throw. It's like you step back three, throw in, in within a second, a second and a half. And uh, five, seven stop step drop, you're doing, you're waiting for two full seconds to see who gets open. So this is a, a huge adjustment. It's like, okay, now how do I do a quick hit? And coming up with a really strong quick hit in 10 minutes or, or, or even less, five minutes, uh, takes a little bit, of, it's, a different, it's a different muscle that you have to use to make that happen. How did COVID contribute to that, to that change? Well, because we, we the, in, it, the idea during COVID was, uh, at least that's what they were telling us, is that the less time you spend together, the less likely COVID is to spread. Uh, again, looking back, who knows? But that's what we were doing. So we, we, had, we had, you know, cut davening to, to, to ribbons. I mean, like we we'd cut it into small pieces. I mean, we, we took away Hazar shots for a while. Right, everything was was uh, was the Ram or Hecha Kedusha, whatever you would call it. Where so we we had cut davening. We were doing davening in an hour and fifteen minutes, and initially I wasn't giving a sermon at all. And then people said, "Look, Rabbi, can you speak for two minutes at the end of davening? Uh, we need a Dvar Torah. So that's when the Dvar Torah started. So it became two, became five. Then as things got a little looser, it became seven. And like I said, now it's it's more or less ten minutes. But when my colleagues speak, they give full sermons. They do give full sermons, and they don't necessarily give it at the end of davening. I, I started at the end of davening right after my I do it. I davening ends. I give my announcements. I speak for ten minutes. I make kiddush, and I I love that. And my colleagues don't don't have the same. Uh, everyone has their own style. They they like doing it before uh, uh, most of like the old style. Uh, I happen to tell people, I say, it's better to speak at the very end because that's when everyone is in shul. Everyone comes late and the latest of the late come at about 11. And if you're going to speak before most, if you're generally going to finish speaking before the latest people come in. So, but, but that's, that happens to be my, that, that's how COVID affected my speaking style. Do you find that people, uh, once it became truncated, they said, well, maybe we don't need all of it. We don't need the same length that we once had. Is that is that part of it at all? I, you know, look, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the reaction to the shorter sermons have been very, very positive. I mean, it, look, you, you, you always have to be very careful that you're not just putting in filler, right? There's the old joke about the rabbi who gives this barn burner of a sermon on Yom Kippur and someone comes up and says to him, you know, Rabbi, I'm a producer for 60 minutes. I would love for you to do, give this message on, uh, on TV for us. But the sermon was 45 minutes and on 60 minutes, we could only give you five minutes. Can you shorten the sermon to five minutes? And the rabbi says, absolutely. So the producer says, so then why didn't you? Uh, in other words, it, sometimes we do put in filler. And I, I think the key is to cut to the point. Uh, and the shorter sermons, if they cut to the point, people appreciate them. People appreciate finishing davening earlier, frankly. Uh, I, you, know, I, I, people, you know, I have not gotten feedback saying, okay, I'd like the longer sermon, and in part, because I have this long written sermon that's sent out by email and is photocopied and put in the back of the shul, uh, which is is actually not a sermon. It's a, it's a written article, that, and which means it's it's denser. If it was actually a sermon, those it would take probably 20, 20 plus minutes to deliver. Uh, in the articles, they're usually in the area of fifteen hundred words, uh, but you know it, it's not the way you would you would speak public. In other words, it's the way you would write but not, not necessarily the way you would speak, which by the way, I think is an important distinction. What you would say verbally in a speech is very different than what you would write in an article. In a speech, you might use um, poetry a bit more. Uh, you might allow a, a little bit of extra language to review something. And in a written article, you don't, you don't do that because you wanna compress things and people can always go back a paragraph and reread. So written articles are not just simply not, not written in the same way that you would give a sermon. 
uh, and a sermon shouldn't be delivered in the same way that you would you would uh, do a written article. Uh, so, but they have my written article, and between my written article and my Tvar Torah, I think I, they, they're they're pretty well covered. So, I want to ask you. I saw an article that you wrote about Chat GPT, about sermons are being written by Chat GPT, and, and tell me your thoughts about that. So, my article was, and and, and there is this whole discussion. There are still AI skeptics. Uh, my son, who happens to have a degree in computational linguistics, uh, had a professor in his program, and computational linguistics literally is how computers use language, uh, had a professor in his program who was a true chat, was a true AI skeptic and believed that at least as it is now, um, what chat GPT does is that it mimics well. Uh, it mimics what it's it's basically a really really good parrot uh and it knows patterns and it knows styles and you could have you when you put something into chat gpt you can almost see what it's mimicking so you know there were a couple of rabbis at the beginning who were very clever and actually very creative to be very honest who said here i'm going to read you a sermon written by chat gpt and the question was, well, what happens to rabbis now if chat GPT can write sermons? And my response was, is that every rabbi, and, and you can't necessarily do this every week, but every rabbi should be aspiring to write a sermon that doesn't fit the ordinary process, right? We, we you know, have almost catchphrases. It's not, it's not a bad thing. But we, we should try as much as possible to be machadish. I, I, I tell this to young rabbis, and, and I, I understand why young rabbis like formulas, and we can talk for a moment about formulas before we're done. But you need to look how to be machadish. And that was my, my point. My point is if chat GPT can write a sermon, that means rabbis are not writing something that sounds different than just the blah, blah, the ordinary, the, the, the repetitive, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, how many sermons are in modern times, this is happening. And the Torah says, now, look, you do need basic messages. You can't have a chiddish on everything. But we should always look for an unusual way to present it. We should always look for the deeper point that maybe isn't put into every other sermon right if let's say the lesson of Yehuda when he wants to save Binyamin is our vote of that you have to be there for and 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 take responsibility for your brothers and sisters in the Jewish people the question you would pose next is why is this such an important value uh what is the spiritual roots of it and then you have to really start to explore it. Does it mean the community comes, comes before the individual? There's many things that, that you have to start exploring. The, the key is, is that <laughs> always look to write a sermon that doesn't sound like it was written by ChatGPT. You need to look for a way of presenting it and a way of even bringing a, a Hiddish into a, an old and well-known idea so that it now people say, oh, that's new, that's different. So uh, that was really my, my point is that don't write sermons that sound like ChatGPT. It's not that ChatGPT will take over our jobs. We've given our jobs over already because we're, we are ChatGPT already. We're just regurgitating the sermonic language of generations. And maybe we need to learn how to be machadish. It's fascinating. Uh, I want to ask you, you know, I think that it, it's my impression that that everyone who is a master at their craft, uh, there's some aspect of it that they struggle through and then they can look backwards and say, wow, I, I really broke through. I've, I've, I put my unique stamp on this. I'm, I'm proud of this. What is it for you? Well, I would say when I started in the rabbinate, I think I, I sometimes was overly complex certainly in shiurim i sometimes got tied up myself and twisted up in the complexity 
And then I kind of shifted and did something very different. And I started to do things that were a little bit lighter and went for, and, and I mean, I always had stories, but then I, I would pour a, a, a mountain of stories. And then I kind of shifted to find that middle path of sort of learning how to, how to illustrate or articulate and, and hit the emotions while at the same time offering something that's really an insight. Uh, trying to come up with an idea that that's just a little bit different that people look at and they say, Oh, this, this is a little different. Uh, whether it be in the actual Torah of it. In other words, let's say in my last week's Torah, I was talking about, you know, why Rashi says that, you know, Yosef sends Agalot uh, wagons and that reminds Yaakov of the last thing they learned together, which is the Egla Rufa. So then, you know, I went into how the Zohar reads this this uh, particular concept and how the how the you, you know the the rid the the Tosos rid brings down a Yerushalmi that's not an hour Yerushalmi, um, and then sort of like grappling with that. But or or in other weeks, I mean, like the Chat GPT one, where everyone is saying Ive Chat GPT is taking over, and I'm saying Ive we've given up. Because we, we as humans haven't decided to be more dynamic than ChatGPT. So like, I'm always looking for a different angle. Look, try, try to be different. People will appreciate it. Now, obviously, it, it needs to be good. It shouldn't be forced. And, and I think that that's also the, one, of, one of the big problems. You know, there's an old story about the student in yeshiva who has a chiddush in Tosfos. He has a way of learning Tosos that, that, that he thinks is a new insight. So he goes to his, his Rebbe and he says, Rebbe, I hear this is the way I want to learn Tosos. And the Rebbe says, what's your hechrech? What, what's, what's your, so to speak, what's driving you to come, with that, come up with that interpretation? And he doesn't have one. Next morning, the Rebbe gives the shear and says the exact same chiddush in the Tosos. So the student comes over to the Rebbe and he says, Rebbe, but what was your hechrech? So the Rebbe says, my hechrech was I had to give a shear. Uh, that, that was what was driving me. I had no choice. Um, we as rabbis, let's try to avoid that hechrech and really try to sort of make sure we're, we're very grounded. But uh, uh, everyone knows that's your hechrech every week. That's the hechrech. Uh, and you have deadlines and deadlines, look, Rabbi Wine used to say that you, you, how do you know that a book is, is ready to go for publication? It's when the publisher tears it out of your hands. So it, 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 we, we know editing is important. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, and, and we know this, The Great Gatsby, the initial draft was, was a rather average book. And it was in the editing that it became brilliant. Uh, and we know that ed the more we edit, the better, the better, hopefully, that the, that the text becomes. But we can't edit forever because we do have Shab Shabbos is coming. Uh, so we have to deal with the um, deadlines. We have to deal with the hechrech of, of producing a sermon every week. Uh, but we, we should try to bring out something that is insightful and something that is well edited. That, that I think, should be what we're, we're, we're hoping to do. Right. I, I know we're over time. I just uh, I wanted to ask one more question, if, if you have the time. Uh, there's different schools of thought about how much of a rabbi's personal life should uh, he, he include in the sermon, uh, either directly or indirectly. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? It's it's. Look, it's it, it's it's not a simple thing. Um, I think that anything that people would find out one way or the other can certainly be included. Things that people might not find out, look, if the rabbi is struggling, let's say, with some sort of dependency, and the rabbi really feels that his sharing will then, or her sharing, will then have an impact on everyone around them, then do it. I, I don't think, I think you, you need to think twice about sharing about your kids. Uh, although, you know, I, when they were little kids, I, I would share little things about them. You know, I, I remember once walking with my three-year-old daughter 
and it was middle of July, and she pointed to the sky, and she says, Abba, look at the crap, the cloud, look at the cloud. And that, that became a sermon about awe, about how we lost, lose the eyes to look at the cloud. My daughter, she sees the cloud, and that, that I, as I called it, was Yom Kippur in July, uh, which, again, is the same type of phrasing. I, I think that type of sharing is innocuous. I think you need to be really careful. Um, in other words, look, in my particular case, my mother is a Holocaust survivor that everyone would know at some point or another, particularly my previous show when my mother would come and visit and everyone knew who my mother was. Uh, in, you know, I'm Chaim Ben Chaim, I'm, right? I'm, I'm named after my father who died a month before I was born in a car accident. So everyone knows I'm Chaim Ben Chaim. So I, I, I can share that and I can talk about that. And I can talk about my mother's life. Uh, particularly, you know, at, at, after she passed away, you know, I, I wrote a eulogy. So people, so I think things that are, 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 so to speak, public domain, for sure, you can, you can relate to that. And you can talk about, you know, I, I very often have spoken about my mother's courage. So, you know, I think that's, that's fair. Um, things that are not public domain, that people would not otherwise know about you. I think you have to be incredibly judicious in sharing. And the same thing with your kids. Um, unless everyone knows that your kid um, has a learning disability, do not reference it. Uh, you could talk about learning disabilities in general, but it's not fair to your kid. Um, if you have a learning disability, I mean, again, I, I, I think it, it, you have to be really, really careful. Uh, and honestly, you don't want every sermon to be about yourself. I mean, you really don't want to over, as much as you want to use your own life experiences, perhaps as, as a way of, of sort of explaining why you're saying what you're saying, uh, you don't want the sermon to be about you. You really want it to be about them. And you want to also be careful about not coming off as, as very self-absorbed as well. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. I feel like I could talk to you for another hour. <laughs> yeah, so I know. It's really nice meeting. When you come to New York, you have to come, come say hello. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. You've been listening to The Magid Method, and I'm Daniel Steinberg. Learn more about The Magid Method at M-A-G-G-I-D-M-E-T-H-O-D.com. Magidmethod.com. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.